that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Do you think these have been light and transient causes? What's, what's, been, what's been coming? They have they've torn the mask off. They're not even hiding stuff anymore. They're just coming out and being criminal. They, they're not even hiding it. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more... Yeah, I don't know why they make this stuff in, in six-point print, right? Or four. Getting old, I guess. You know, what's funny is you give me a scope and a little rifle and show me something at a half a mile, and I see it perfectly with my bare eyes. But when it comes to this little print up close, forget it. That mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evil is sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. And that's the problem. We've gotten accustomed to this stuff. Well, I can't look up with these. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. I'm going to stop right there. And the reason, the reason we're here is we're all tired. We're all fed up. We've all awakened to the corruption. And unfortunately, I think most of our founding fathers are surprised that we lasted this long. Most governments don't last a couple hundred years. They, they have to renew themselves. Even England has renewed itself with each king or queen, and uh, that's, that's one of the actual benefits of having a king or queen. If you have a righteous king, you live under prosperity. You have an evil king, well, then things are a problem, and you need to take him out, right, and, and be righteous. But when you have an elected form of government who has become a democracy, we are not a democracy. We are a republic. This country was founded as a republic. And this word democracy has destroyed this nation. Because democracy is a very definition of mob rule. And the Democratic Party is the Communist Party. And that's where they originated, and that's where they came from, and that's what they still are. And that's a problem. The biggest problem is that we have parties at all. Because parties are just there to divide us in the first place. I sit down and I talk to a, a staunch Democrat, and if you give me enough time, we're brothers and he's on our side. And I can do that every time, without fail, if he'll just give me the time and listen. And it's not that I'm so darn convincing, it's that I've studied it so long that I can point out facts he didn't see. And as I point out those facts, then he comes around. I'll tell you a little thing about Ronald Reagan. I was a big fan of Ronald Reagan. Okay? I actually have some special ties to the man, ties that if you were in my office and you were in my my glass cabinet, you would see things that literally were his, that are now mine. And I think one of the funniest little jokes I know about Reagan 
is when he was running for office as a Republican, he went out into the farmland of America, and the farmers were all Democrats back then. All of them were oh. Democrats. And he saw a farmer next to the road in his field by a tractor. And he pulled over and he stopped and he, he says, hi, my name is Ronald Reagan, I'm a Republican. And uh, I was wondering if you knew would listen to my views. And the farmer says, yes, I'd love to hear your views, but I gotta go get Ma. Can we go to the house? And they drove up to the house and the farmer runs in to get Ma and Ronald Reagan's standing around kind of looking for a little bit of an elevated place to give his speech from. And the only thing he can find is a pile of manure, old dried manure. <laughs> so he, he stands up on there and Ma and Pa come out and uh, he starts giving his speech and pretty soon, because he was so convincing, he was so good at the, the facts and the knowledge, Ma says, I really loved what you had to say. I've never heard a Republican speak before. And Ronald Reagan looks down and he says, that's okay. I've never given a speech from a Democratic platform. <laughs> so anyway, that's my Ronald Reagan joke. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll use these for a minute. Our founding fathers did something for us. Did I even spell that right? so careful in the Bill of Rights that they they put things in a very, very specific order. Why Message did they put from Miss Shannon. My daughter, you know? my bird, Army Will. The, that's right. First things first. The first event. The most important. God. The freedom to worship in whatever respect we want. I don't care what religion you are. I died to protect that right. Okay? But this was to give us a moral compass. A moral direction. Okay? Very, very important. Then freedom of speech was so that we could talk about it. So we could then write about it so that we could assemble in groups like this and talk more about it. And then we could go and redress our grievances. And then uh, we could defend it. And then this is the order that was put in the Bill of Rights right at the very, very beginning for a very important and specific reason. And without that order, without those rights, we wouldn't have freedom. We wouldn't have freedom. But where is this country gone? Well, its moral compass is being destroyed. It's being destroyed by a very small percentage of the population that is now trying to become a very large percentage of the population. My wife Bonnie says 60 to 70 percent of all the women prisoners where she's at are lesbians. The 
gay community is huge. Now, if you want to do that, that's fine. But don't use it as a political advantage or to destroy other people's rights. And that's a problem. You go into the schools, you start doing what they're doing right now to our young children. And there are hopefully a lot of people like me who are going to be there when you come out. Because that ain't right. It's not right and it's happening all over this country. And I am sick of seeing it on every news program there is. I open my iPad and I get all these notifications. I get, I'm getting emails that I sure didn't ask for that are showing me all these things. And I can't hardly stand it in here. I don't like the direction that, that we're morally taking in this country. That is bothering me more than just about anything right now other than corruption in our judicial system. Now, yesterday I started to write the administrative, judicial, and legislative branch. I put we the people's branch of government as the legislative branch. Why did I do that? Because that is the branch of government where we're supposed to go to in our states to redress our grievances. It's called a remonstrance. And do you know in this nation, there was a man named John Gentry, and I love John. He was out of Tennessee. But he wrote one of the first remonstrances to the Tennessee legislature. And the only remonstrance to any legislative body in this nation that was ever submitted in 120 years. We went 120 years without someone submitting a remonstrance to the legislative body. That's 120 years of football and sports and fishing and hunting and distraction and raising families without paying attention to things that are wrong. I would like to see everybody in this room write their own remonstrance. Pick something you disagree with that you think is important enough that you need to hit one of your state legislators for and address your grievance. This is the area that has stopped us and what's caused the corruption is we quit standing up. In those remonstrances, we need to say, hey, look, Mr. Legislator, if you're not going to pay attention to this that is so important to me and the people around me that I am writing this to you, then well, I'm not going to vote for you next time. Mm -hmm. You're going to be out of office. In fact, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure you're out of office. See, I don't care whether someone runs as a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. You vote for the man and his purpose, his goals. And if you don't like what your Republican is doing, well, then vote for the other guy. Just don't vote at a whole party ticket. That doesn't get us anywhere. All that does is make one party stronger or the other party stronger. That's all it does. Now, Trump ain't going to like it when I say that. And I'm a big supporter of him. I think there's a lot of things he does wrong. I think there's a lot of things that I would have done differently. But he's done more. I judge a man by his works. He's done more for us than any other president. Period. Period. In history. He's done more for the American people. 
and he's done more to clean up this nation long after he's no longer president than any president has ever done. He's put things in place. All we got to do is understand what they are and go act on them, go move on them. He's already put them in place. And I'm not seeing too many people act on those things. Like corruption in our judicial system. Like trafficking. Do you know he made trafficking an international crime? And he told us things that we don't recognize as a people. Now, I recognize them because I've been teaching it for 30 years. So when you know something and you see it, you recognize it. But most average people don't recognize some of the things he did. We have thoughts in our mind when I say something like child trafficking. Everybody thinks of little kids. What did I say the definition of a minor was? Exactly right. My wife is being child trafficked right now at the age of 55 because she has not claimed her minor estate yet. She was in the process of learning how to do it. We've only been married a year and a half, by the way. Well, August 31st of 2021 is when her and I got married. And there's a lot of things I'm finding out now that I didn't know. Otherwise, I probably came in, could have came in a year ago and solved them before it got real bad. But there's a reason it happened the way it happened. And I see it clear as day, and God shows it to me on a regular, consistent basis. When I'm lying there in bed, and I'm ready to just go take them all out and get her out of jail and do the things that I know I can do, God says, hold on a minute, David. Knock it off. This is what has to happen. This is why she's here. This is the order we've got to follow. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to get exposed to the masses, to the world. She's on a mission right now. Let her do her mission. All day yesterday, I'm waiting for her phone call. Waiting for her phone call. Last night, I get a phone call from a husband who happens to be Bonnie's bunk mate's husband. Wanted me to know Bonnie cannot call me and to tell me she loves me and she can't call me. So not to worry that she's okay. Now, if Bonnie was bleeding and lying on the floor, she'd tell me she's okay. You understand that, right? So I continue to worry, but I didn't get to talk to her yesterday. Talked to her one day out of the last five. And one reason, she's always getting in trouble, helping others. <coughs> she will risk her life to help somebody else. And she is on a mission. And I'm constantly reminded of that by God. It keeps me up at night. What's that? Yeah, I don't much care about that. <coughs> I really don't. So, we need to address our grievances. We need to do everything in our power not to use these. Be a peaceful people. This is why the peace flag is our background. This is the America's peace flag. I've got pictures of our buildings, our commerce buildings, our 
our Capitol buildings flying this flag in the 1800s. Anybody here that's from the Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard, we have any? What is this flag? Put the Coast Guard logo right here. That's the Coast Guard flag. Why? Because the Coast Guard was set up as a civil organization under our military. Civil. They're to guard our shores. <clears throat> to guard our people. The rest of the military goes around the world. The Coast Guard guards our shores. And that's their flag. They adopted the peace flag and put their logo in the middle of it. So for people to tell me, well, this flag isn't a U.S. flag, well, you better study history. Okay? I've got a picture on my iPad with one of the very first Confederate soldiers who had just got his uniform and he's young, <clears throat> standing with his family in a small town in Louisiana in front of the only building in town that was a government building. And he's standing there taking a picture with his family about ready to head to war. And he's got to walk all the way to Virginia from Louisiana. And that fly was flying over that building when that picture was taken. Right before the war started. Right immediately after 11 delegates from seven southern states walked out of Congress, leaving Congress sin die with no date to ever resume. And Texas went off on its own and formed its own nation. The other southern states went back under the Articles of Confederation. One of our founding documents that was written more than almost 100 years earlier. And they decided to be the Confederate States of America in a war of northern aggression. What do I mean by that? How did the Civil War start? What started it? Do you guys know? Texas. Senator Morrill passed an unfair tax bill. Taxes the, were uh, supposed to be uh, equal across uh, everybody. Something act from Britain. And he passed a tax bill, got it signed by the president at the time, that... Oh unfairly taxed the people of the South. The farmers of the South were paying up to 60% tax on their tobacco and their cotton and other items. Well, the manufacturing companies of the North were paying 6%. And those delegates, notice the term I used? Delegate, not representative. They're not our representatives. That's a democracy. They're our delegates. Words are important. And 11 delegates from seven southern states walked out of Congress in the middle of the session and went home. Those states pulled away from the Union, from the United States. And they have flipped the script so much they're taking down Confederate statues all over the South. Let me tell you something. If this day was then, I would join the Confederate side because of what I know. Understand that. They were in the right. They were addressing their grievance. And here, 
their statues have been taken down, their grave sites graffitied and busted up, torn apart. I don't know about you, but that's not my America. That's not how I was raised. That's not how I want to be. And there, I think the reason we're all here are along the same lines of those kind of reasons of what they're doing to us. What the AMA is doing to us, what the CDC is doing to us, what the FBI is doing to our president, what the FBI has tried to do to me. They've come and visited me a few times. I usually send them packing within about three minutes. But I do it because of the knowledge I have. And I don't consent. Now, I don't doubt that it could come for me again. Let me tell you something. Again, it's about that circle, that good and evil circle. And you can write every agency on earth in it. And there's FBI agents that absolutely love what I'm doing and encourage me. They write me letters. They send me emails. They call me on the phone. They say you're doing the right thing. And there's FBI agents that could be in this room right now. I don't know. I've actually had them attend seminars. And they came for nefarious purposes. See? I welcome them to come, by the way. I've always done that. I want the judges. I want the attorneys. I want the police officers. I want the FBI. I want government agents to come to my meetings. Because if they'll give me three days, they'll be on my side. And I'm confident of that. I had one in Columbia, Tennessee. He sat through the class all day Friday, all day Saturday. Saturday night, he writes me a letter on a yellow legal pad. Sunday morning, I'm up there. I'm getting my mic on. I'm up there getting my stuff ready. And he walks up and says, David, here. I just want to let you know that I'm with the FBI. And I came here for other reasons. But I listened to you for two days. Read this. And he left. Couldn't stay on Sunday. His wife wanted him home. And the letter said that he wasn't really there for the conference. He was sent there from the headquarters of the FBI out of Huntsville, Alabama. Yes, the FBI headquarters has moved to Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. Most agencies of government have moved out of Washington D.C. It's pretty much a ghost town. I can remember when Reagan was in the White House, and it took 15 minutes to drive across the park because the traffic was so heavy. That was in the 80s. Now you can get across the park in 30 minutes, in 30, less than, all the way across town in 30 minutes now. There's just no traffic there. So, that letter was pretty interesting letter he wrote me. In fact, he told me a lot of secrets about government and what they're doing. He told me about things that I'm doing that he encouraged me to keep doing in that letter. He told me about his life and his family and what he believes. Can you imagine an agent of government saying that and stuff about his personal life to you? It was one of the best written letters I've ever had. And I kept it. I've got a whole book of letters that I've kept over the years. If we don't understand these things, we don't understand how to take care of them. We just don't. And Mike said something pretty cool. I'm going to keep using that name, Mike. Or Mike the singer name. <clears throat> he said something pretty cool. I 
actually wish he was back up here to say it again. But we as a people, we cannot any longer afford for our children and our grandchildren's future to allow them to get away with the things they're getting away with now. We can't allow them to do it. And I'll tell you what's been happening with our courts. Literally, it's been going on. It started getting worse in 1972, but it got a whole lot worse in 85. And ever since 85, our court system in this nation has been running rogue. Absolutely rogue. Doing their own thing and not following the law. And they've been doing that in every court. I've watched the Mothers with young babies being taken by CPS, going into family courts. I've watched it get to the point where it's almost impossible to even fight in a family court. Even if you file all the right paperwork, you do all the right thing, you object to all the right reasons, on and on and on, they just do whatever the hell they want to do. They don't even follow the law. I've sat in courtrooms and I've asked the judges, are you following the doctrine of parents' patry right now? Yes or no? And the judges say, absolutely yes. I said, you know that's a false and fraudulent doctrine, right? The Bible tells us so. That our children are a gift to the parent. And you have <laughs> no right as a man to take that child away from her mother or her father. No right whatsoever. Supreme Court and case what? says that parents utmost responsibility education their children. Every state to call it something different. Department of Human Health and Human Resources. They call it all kinds of different things in different states. Child Protective Services. What created that agency? Do you guys know? Nobody knows. That's interesting. The IRS. What's that? No. The IRS. What created it was Social Security. Title IV of Social Security. Bill Clinton helped. No, he didn't. He hurt us bad. But with the, Ad the Adoption and Safe Families Act, that's another method of funding, federal funding, that's an incentive to take children from their parents. The Adoption and Safe Fam uh, Family Act. Title IV of Social Security is what created Child Protective Services and it's how they get paid. And it incentivized kidnapping of children from their parents. That's what it did. And it allowed these family courts through the GSA program to take money out of your trust. Now, how many new people know that they have a trust in their name? How many don't? Okay. What if I was to tell you you're worth a hundred million dollars right now? Bare minimum. In fact, I've never seen one that low. You can access it. Going to take you with some knowledge first. Yeah, you got to unlearn a whole bunch of crap that you were taught, and then you've got to learn a new way of speaking and a new way of standing, being competent, having the right status, and understanding your jurisdictions and taking dominion over them as God commanded you to do. Years ago, after having a lot of 
religious classes, having grown up in a religious household, having a lot of religious classes in high school and college, And going out in the world and going to different churches of different religions so I could learn what their beliefs were. I wasn't there to be there. I wasn't really there to be there to worship God. I was there to study. And I went and I studied and I took notes and I wrote things down and I learned what their core beliefs were of different religions. And in doing so, I figured some things out. One was even Jesus Christ was against organized religion. And as I went around to different churches, I picked out the reasons why. It became very crystal clear to me. Now, if you go to one church all the time, it's a church you like, and you associate with the people in it, and you like the preacher or whoever's running the show, I don't think you ever see that. But when you go to different religions and you write down their basic principles and you listen to what they're saying and how they're actually going, a lot of them, against the Word of God, what they do is they grab the Bible and they pick out feel goody. Do you know what feel goody is? Okay, first they start off like this they preach holy hell and Satan. They do. And they make you really feel bad for your sins. And then they change course in the middle. And they start bringing out the feel goody. And they make you feel good. And then you put a lot of money in the collection plate. And you leave happy. And sometimes fed. Sometimes those are pretty good meals after those, those church services. And that's what happens. And I'm, I'm starting to go, well... Gosh, I've read the Bible by that time about 20 or 30 times. I, I kind of understand the principle of it all. Why are they only using certain scriptures and pulling them out of context? They're pulling them out of context, just the feel-goody scripture out of a whole story. And when they do that, they don't get the meaning of the story across or the parable. And they don't get it across to you. And I realized, well, it's to put more money in the collection plate. And here's where I'm going with this. I learned even the religion that I grew up in doesn't follow their own doctrine. And that bothered me. So I went back to church and I volunteered to give a talk at a, the next meeting. <laughs> Imagine that. Me? Anyway, I got up there and I talked, and I started reading from their own doctrine. And I could see two or three of the leadership of the church getting very nervous as I'm speaking, and I'm keeping my eye on them speaking to the congregation and they're getting very very nervous and pretty soon just before the end of my speech my talk I see them get up out of their chairs away from their families and walk over and stand at the wall at the aisle way where they knew I had to exit the stage and the minute I did and I as I'm walking past them you know, and I'm trying to be friendly and just get past them. They say, can you come with us? And they called me into the back room. And they chastised me. They did more than chastise me. They threatened me. And I said, that's okay. See, because once I leave these doors today, I'm never stepping foot back in here again. And except for one, one of my sisters died and her funeral happened to be in that church, I never did. That was the only time I ever stepped back, my foot back in there. I never stepped back in there for a service again. See? And the reason I'm telling you this is we've got to do that. Not just with our own churches, we've got to call them out. 
but we've got to call them out for this moral reason <laughs> because they're teaching a lot of stuff that they shouldn't be teaching anymore. Now, here's another thing I learned. The Bible is a trust indenture. Everybody goes, what? If you read the Bible without paying attention to what book you're in, what chapter, what verse, just read the words as a complete story, you'll actually see the trust. Most people skip around in the Bible. I've done that many times myself. But Genesis, in Genesis, God created everything. We didn't create nothing. We took what he created and we reformed it and made a table or a building or a floors. But he created it all and it's his. And we came into this world naked and we're going to leave naked with nothing. So material stuff shouldn't matter to you. And when I was young, material stuff mattered a lot. And I learned better. And now I don't care what I have. I told Bonnie a million times, give me you, a sleeping bag and a tent, and a little bit of food to eat, and I'm happy. I don't care about all the crap. What the house is, what furniture is. She's the one that cares about that. And as long as she does, I'll support her habit. Because if she's happy, I'm happy, right? That's the way it is. Even the king bows to the queen. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, happy wife, happy life. So we, we do what's necessary, but I can live without it myself. But when you read the Bible as a trust indenture, you learn that God is the executor of the trust. He put the trust into existence. He created everything. He put everything into it. And then he commanded me, man, mankind. He commanded us to take dominion, to take dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and everything therein, and subdue it. Now, in Hebrew, the word subdue is a little bit different than what Americans think the word subdue is. Especially our American military. They think subdue is put a boot on somebody's neck. Okay? To subdue means to have knowledge. To know it. To know it so well that you control it. That you can use it your knowledge for the benefit of others. And so he made me, man, mankind, the trustee. And as I become man, an adult, then who am I the trustee for? The beneficiaries. This is why God goes into the begats. Who begat whom and who begat whom and who begat. It's the genealogy of the people of the world and it goes on forever. Back in the Bible, it's the hardest part to get through, right? <laughs> Most people skip it, right? They skip the names of all the beneficiaries. But when you read it, you see that the intention is to go on forever. What's the definition of the word forever? And of the earth, to the end of the earth. That means we are also the beneficiaries. We're not only the trustees, but we're the beneficiaries. We're the trustees for our future generation and for those around us to make sure things are taken care of patent, properly. Run, Gibson. Fiduciary wise as well. That was hard to say for me. My tongue got tied there. Fiduciary wise. 
And we're the trustees for those reasons, but we're also the beneficiaries to receive. And therefore, the Bible is a trust indenture. And in reality, it's two trust indentures. The New Testament is another one. And if you read it as a trust, you're going to get more out of it. You're going to get a lot more out of it. In fact, your mind will start opening up, and things will become a whole lot clearer to you if you're looking at it as a trust. All nations I am not were even formed as a trust. Do you know that? The Catholic Church in the 1600s tried to take the trust from God and from its people. And they did it with the Unum Sanctum, claiming the right to all souls. And then they did it in three follow-up trusts. We call them testamentary trusts. Setting aside the jurisdiction, well, the first trust set aside the jurisdiction of the land. And it made the trustee who? No. The trustee of the land. Who did it? No? Okay. You guys aren't coming up with it, so I'm going to tell you. The king of Spain. The king of Spain became the trustee of the jurisdiction of the land. Do you know what he did? He said, that's not my position. And he gave it back to mankind. He didn't accept being the trustee. And he gave it the jurisdiction of the land to all the men and women of the world forever. The jurisdiction of the air, the Vatican kept for itself. The jurisdiction of the water, they gave to the monarchies of Great Britain in admiralty to control the seas. And England started building a massive amount of ships They did that to control the world. Now, people also say, well, I thought Spain produced the most ships. What was their reason? So I'm going to tell you what their reason was. Spain produced the most ships for the righteous reasons. As the heirs of King Solomon. Here's a big confusion a lot of American patriots have. If I said something like the 13 families, most people would go, okay, that's the cabal, that's the Rothschilds, that's this, that's that. That's well, that's true. That's how the evil side mirrored the righteous side. Evil always puts a mirror up. They always take something that's righteous, mirror it, and then destroy it, try and destroy it. And that's how they keep their belief and their confusion with the people. See? Spain created all those ships to go around the world and gather all the gold and silver and treasures of the world. Do you know why? Do you think they were plundering other countries? No, they weren't. And I'll tell you why. Because all the gold and silver was given to King Solomon, the son of King David. King David is the most mentioned king in the Bible. He's mentioned more than Jesus Christ himself in the Bible. Wow. And his son, King Solomon, at that period of history, was blessed by God. He literally was followed, his following encompassed the earth. And he had miners 
in nations all around the world. And so when you hear of King Solomon's mines, it's not some hidden place in Africa they've been trying to discover. That's what the movies told you. His mines were in Papua New Guinea and the Philippines and in South America with the Incans and the Mayans. And his mines were up in Alaska and Canada. His mines were all over Europe. Yeah, you can go to Scotland and mine gold. Okay. God put in his trust all the gold and silver in the world. Every piece that had ever been taken out and every piece that was still there and is still there is under and held in trust by the descendants of King Solomon. And so when I say 13 families, those are 13 families that exist around the world that are holding the gold and silver in trust for you. And both the evil system that was allowed to exist and the righteous system that has existed since Solomon is all based upon the righteous deposits of those gold and silver. And this is a message that has not been told much to the American people. It's one of the other things I've been doing for 30 years in the intelligence world. One of my jobs was to help get all the royal families together on the same page. Most of them would never talk to each other. None of them trusted each other. Within the families themselves, they didn't trust each other. It was a massive undertaking that took more than 30 years. And now we have all their signatures in the same document. They're united now. Some of them are still trying to run things their own way, but they're united now and have agreed that in the end days, which they've always known, that they were the trustees. Always have known it. That is knowledge has been passed down for generation upon generation in those families. They always know. They were the trustees for the benefit of the people of the world in the last days. And all that gold has been collected and put in vaults around the world and all held by private trust companies guarded by militaries of the world paid for by those families to guard. Yeah, they fund our military. Let me clarify this for a minute. The reason a little tiny young kid named Parker Schnabel, who's been on this show called Gold Rush for a decade now, started out when he was like, I don't know, 17 or 18 years old or something, the reason he has to get a mining permit up in the Yukon to move millions of cubic yards of, of dirt to get a few thousand ounces of gold, the reason he has to get a mining permit is so governments know how much gold is being taken out of the ground because it's in trust under King Solomon. And that's why a miner has to get a mining permit. Most of the miners don't even know that's the reason. It all has to be accounted for. And eventually it gets melted down. It gets put, some of it gets put into big bars. And when those bars are made, there's a World Bank number and a King's seal stamped on the bottom of each one of those bricks. And that's when they go to the depositories. They get made into rings, they get made into all kinds of things. And they're used as they're meant to be used. You got a gold chain around your neck, I got a silver ring on. They're meant to be used by the people. 
for whatever purpose we want. A gold cross, a silver ring. But eventually, all gold is held in trust on deposit. The beneficiaries just get the use of it. And I'm one of the beneficiaries with this right here. And one of the beneficiaries with this right here. And because I hold this in my possession, I'm a beneficiary. If I don't have any gold or silver, and I just got fiat currency in my pocket. What am I? And it, indigent and a pauper. Where's your proof if you don't? Ah, so there lies the problem. Look at my wife, Bonnie. I got more than a half a million dollars of this crap in my safe. Okay? Did she take some into the courtroom with her? Back before she knew any of this crap? Before she was, when she was a good slave, a good U.S. citizen, back in 2015? Had she walked into the courtroom with it? She wouldn't be there today. They deemed her in, indigent back then. That was long before I met her. Understand that's why she's there, some other reason. It's not privileged. Rights are purchased. They're given to us. They're a gift. They were purchased with Christ's blood. All of our rights were. Yes, they were. Yeah. I've been there for a I am describing two separate systems, good and evil. This has always been a war. Everything we're going through is a war between good and evil. This is what I'm trying to get across, and it's not easy to get this across. It's not an easy thing. And I'm trying to give you a little helpful hints at saying it differently than anyone else is going to say it in the world that you're in. They're not going to tell you what I'm telling you. Many of them don't know. This is a problem we have with people like Kim Guggen advising people about the financial stuff. She hasn't got a clue. She's not even involved. She, her name's not on anything anymore. It was, but she screwed up. So they removed her. She continues. Now she doesn't know what she's even talking about. So, on and on and on. This is how it is. You've got the descendants of King Solomon, those heirs of those 13 families that are running things. What did the United States do over time? They started taking those families out. Ferdinand Marcos. Oh, God in heaven. They lied. They said he took five to seven billion of his own people's money and his wife spent it on shoes. Bullshit. He did nothing but put money out of the royal family into the people of the Philippines because they were entitled to it. So then our government took over the Philippines and put in their own government. And right now, we finally got a Marcos in as running the de facto government for the United States. Kind of a key. It's like having our own little Trumpy over there. Okay? Does he know everything? No. He's got to learn too. Everything's a learning curve for all these guys because they don't know the, all the history. And I said, one member of the Marcos family in my office, and I'm telling her things about her own family she doesn't even know. Well, she's on the right track. And she's growing within their organization. So I'm all for her. I love her. I hope she continues to learn and continues to grow and continues to do what she can do to help. But these are the things that we've had to do over time. 
because it's coming, and it's coming so fast. I don't know if you've been watching the bank failures around the world, the new sovereign currencies, the, the governments that are pulling away from the UN right now. This is a beautiful, fun time to be living in. When you see those things, when you research them, and when you, you know so that you recognize if you don't know, you don't recognize what is right in front of your face. So you have to have an open mind. You have to know a little so that you can recognize what's going on. And as you do, you will continue to wake up. Your minds will continue to expand. You'll continue to learn more and more things. Notice my seminars have been getting a little different because I believe we're at a period of time where I have to get different. You can learn a lot of the crap that I've been teaching out of the books, off the videos. Off. There's no reason for me to do much of that anymore. Sure, I should read the eight parts of a contract, and I probably will. But, I mean, those things are important, especially for the new people. But I'm telling you, you can get those off the videos. What I'm trying to give you here and it's hard, is insights, little tiny hints and insights of what's going on in the world that is changing the world. So we put one of our team members over at, in Switzerland, the UBS Bank, and it released several trillion dollars of deposit money into Africa the only way that money can be released, guys, is to fund humanitarian projects. That's how it has to be released. So first we had to go find humanitarian projects, write all the paperwork, get all the documentation, submit it to the royal families, get approval. Then the royal families give permission to the guy with the badge who can walk into the bank and sit in front of the terminal. And when he punches in his information, <laughs> All his authorization comes up on the screen, and the bank president's mouth goes. And then it's, okay, what do you need? Because not even the presidents, the CEOs of these banks, which have been created with these accounts, these type of accounts, can access those accounts. It takes the signatures of all the families, and it takes the guy with the badge, holds the trust in order to release those accounts. And then you can't release the big accounts because the management fees that have to be paid are 4%. And 4% of an account that's maybe uh, something like this, 478, followed by 152 zeros, is one hell of a lot of money. And 4% of that's Nobody's got it. The Fed, we could sell everything that the United States government has. They couldn't come up with the, the money to release and pay the management fees on some of these accounts. And this is what governments were trying to do. The Pentagon was trying to do is they were trying to, trying to release the money in some of these accounts that are so big that nobody could accomplish it. So what we had to do was say, hey, in some banks, there are smaller accounts. Let's show you. And so we found a bank with the smallest account, and we paid the management fee, and released some of the money, and it went to benefit the people, and the governments went, oh, I guess it can be done. You know who's the big holdout? You know who's trying to stop it on behalf of the cabal? Yep, us. Our leaders, so so called. They're not. They're not our leaders. They're the they're the army. They're the army of the the cabal. They're the pillar, the Washington Monument. You know that big thing in the middle of D.C. that goes up like that, and it's got a little tip on the top that's 1,666 feet high and 666 inches across its base. You 
got to understand, we're our own worst enemies when I'm speaking as we, as our nation. But who is the people? We're the nation. We're the government. We have to redress our grievances. We've got to stand up. We've got to say, no, enough is enough. We've got to say, take that pillar down. You know, I wouldn't mind if they just put a little explosives at the bottom side and drop it in the reflecting pond. But something's got to take place. Things have got to change. The pillars need to fall. You understand that, right? Educate America. We can't go on doing what we've been doing and expect not to be destroyed ourselves. Somebody with a computer, pull up Isaiah 59, 14 through 19. We'll just take a little out of the middle. I'll give you the highlights, paraphrase. There is no justice to be found on the land. Our people are being destroyed by justice. By not having any. And no man is standing as an intercessor for the people. One man can't do it by themselves anyway. That's the problem. It's grown too big, too bloated, too many courts, too many judges, too many attorneys, too. It's, it's overwhelmingly large. If one man works 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and does all the paperwork in the world, submits it to every court in the land, hopefully all it does is wake a few people up because he's not going to accomplish anything. And I already know it's a futile effort. And I'm doing it right now. In every court in other words, the Supreme Court, the District Court, the circuit, Federal Circuit Courts, the State Court, the Appellate Court. I've got cases in all of them based on body right now, and more so. I've got it going to the Military Court of Justice. I've got it in the Court of Claims in D.C. That's the District of Columbia. This isn't even our country. I'm putting in all of them at the same time and fighting in each of those courts on her behalf to do one thing. To put it on the public record in every court in the land that there will not be any justice. And we know there won't. I don't expect them to do one thing that's right and righteous. Because that's the point in history we've reached. I don't expect them to. So what I'm going to do is show that they're doing everything wrong. And show the world. That's a very dangerous thing for me. That's like climbing out of the foxhole and standing in front of the army. Armed with nothing but a pen and a piece of paper. And they're going to shoot bullets. I guarantee it. I want you to know that. If we don't expose this, the Send nation falls. And in Isaiah 59, it says, God sees that there is no man who is an intercessor for the people. And he stands in the west and he looks towards the east and he destroys. He destroys evil from the coasts. Now, some versions of the Bible are going to say things a little bit differently. They're going to use the word island. That's a misinterpretation. It's a, 
It's an abomination of the Hebrew language it was written in. From the coast, and he will destroy every major city. And the Illuminati, they think, oh, Denver, Colorado's up high, and it's going to be saved. I promised myself that I would not tell you this right here, sitting here in Florida. For the last five months, our plates of the world, of our earth, have been breaking up. The amount of earthquakes, the size of the earthquakes has increased. If, if you know, if you got a, a, a 4.0 earthquake and it goes to a 5.0, that's 10 times more powerful, right? Okay, so areas of our earth where we've had lots of earthquakes in the past that were twos and threes, are now fours and fives, and some of them sixes and sevens. So they, not only they're increasing in the amount of earthquakes over the last five months, but they're increasing in size to the effect that we've had more than 10,000 times the effect on the Earth's surface by earthquakes in the last five months than we've had in the last 100 years. And the plates are breaking. One of the most solid sections of plates. Now, everybody knows California and its reputation for earthquakes, right? Because it's got some of the biggest faults, fault lines there is. It comes up through the Gulf of California, through between Baja and Mexico, and it comes up San Andreas Fault and so forth. It goes all the way up through San Francisco, kind of goes under the Golden Gate Bridge, goes out to sea a little bit. And then when it hits southern Oregon, it takes an immediate jog out to sea. Literally a 90-degree angle jog. And you can see it on Google Earth. If you look at the water off the coast of the west coast on Google Earth, you will see the fault line take an immediate 90-degree turn right on Google Earth. Because the plate of our continental plate, where it goes underneath the Pacific plate, right off the coast of Oregon, has been solidified. And it's been a solid thing that's kept us from moving. And then it goes out to sea and it goes up around Alaska and so forth, right? Around the Pacific Rim, where most of the earthquakes happen, okay? All the way around the Pacific. Well, that solid plate has now fractured and there's hot water geysers coming up all along maybe a hundred miles off the Oregon coast 120 miles off the coast it's been coming along and breaking up so what's happening is this I'm just trying to explain this a little bit okay you have two pool table balls they're solid they're hard right one hits the other and it moves fast because it's so solid. It moves and it moves off course. Imagine something hitting the earth, a, sol a solid ball hitting the earth and, and the earth being cancer. solid and having it go clear off course to where it's a catastrophic event that changes all of our atmosphere and everybody dies. It's an extinction level event. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want us all to die. So if the plates get broken up ahead of time, and now it's not solid anymore, and something hard hits it, it absorbs the impact. And it doesn't get shoved off course. And we don't have an extinction level event. But what if... It hits off the coast of Florida into that warm water that's 90 degrees. And it shoves that water up the east coast and up through Greenland and Iceland and into the Hudson Bay. And it's 
a large wall of water, warm water, and it starts melting all that ice, all that ice that's north, and it shoves the plates. And the Rocky Mountains are there because the plates have been shoved before, and the Rocky Mountains raised up, the country broke in half, and it caused a lot of volcanic activity. Okay? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm trying to tell you a little science. All right? And something like Yellowstone, that giant caldera of liquid lava that is inside the earth right there, goes off and travels 500 miles to the southeast, well, Denver's in a little bit of a problem there. So the Illuminati's been thinking Denver's safe, and been building all kinds of stuff under the airport, and Denver airport and everything. Is this unknown knowledge to anybody of you? Or did you know this stuff? Okay, all right. This is why the government has spent $800 billion refortifying Cheyenne Mountain, NORAD in the last decade. Why would they spend that much money? Why would they spend over a trillion dollars in the last 10 years with the Army Corps of Engineers to raise all the levees across the heartland in Missouri and all the way up? Why would they do that? They know they can't stop the water, but they can stop the erosion and help cut down the erosion that's going to happen. So that warm water goes up the east coast, goes up north, and it comes through and spills over the Hudson Bay through the Great Lakes, and it washes down the Mississippi, and it cuts the country in half. What if that happened? Just what if? <clears throat> well, it's going to cause a lot of things. Everything east of the Rocky Mountains under about 750 feet of elevation is going to be wiped out. Now some of that is higher elevation is just going to drain off. But it could be wiped out. Where's your safe zone? Where is it? The United States Geological Survey has created maps where the safe zones are. The United Nations have been putting an inland port on the mountains above Salt Lake City. An inland port. Why? A shipping port. Why? Because the West Coast takes a dive under the Pacific Plate, and the tallest mountains of California and Oregon become islands in the ocean. The old water line is still there. You can drive down the Interstate 15 through Salt Lake all the way north through into Utah, and you can see the water line on the mountains where it used to be. They say, not me, they say that that's where the water line is going to be. God tells you in the Bible he's going to wipe out all the big cities and destroy all the evil, destroy the corruption of our justice system because there's no justice on the land. But this is a worldwide event where the population drops by two-thirds. See, the cabal is known or tried to tell you by the Georgia Guidestones and many other things that they want the population of the world to drop 90% with 10% left over to service the 1%. That ain't never going to happen. That's the evil's plan. Where do most of the evil live, guys? Big cities, coastlines, east and west coast. We have prophets in this nation that started three religious organizations all about the 1820s. Every one of those have been telling you that this is coming and to move into the rural areas to higher ground and get out of the big cities. And everybody's been ignoring it. Everybody's ignored the prophecies. No, they don't know anything. They just don't know. 
Well, what if every intelligence agency in the world and every agent of government and every government in the world is saying the same thing? What if they issue satellite phones to all of Congress and the Senate for the event that this happens, that's coming soon? What if they've known since 2003 and they've put it on their websites and they've put it out there in the open for everybody to see and nobody sees it? And they've been doing it for years. What if? What would you think? What if I told you I have at least five maps on my iPad from different military and agencies of the world? I've got five just from the US. What if I told you I have more from other countries? other nations, other militaries that have studied, that have learned, that have seen. Oh yeah, once you see something, it's hard to unsee it. When I was a kid, I didn't believe in aliens at all. In fact, I wouldn't watch Star Trek. I wouldn't watch any of that shit because I believed as God is, man once was. That he created us in his image. that as God is, man may become. That there's worlds without end, greater than the sands of the ocean. And one day, if we live righteously and learn enough, we could someday hope to be a God of our own world, our own earth. What if? And so you tell me there's something out there that's different than that, different than God and man and that image of mankind. I grew up as a little kid saying, uh, there ain't no aliens. That stuff doesn't exist. There aren't these weird tall creatures with three eyes and you know whatever they might look like. No way. That's what I believed. It was almost impossible to convince me otherwise. Now I'm a firm believer because I saw it with my own eyes. Now I look like a crazy conspiracy theorist. Yeah, the definition of conspiracy theory is six months. <laughs> All you need is six, six months of study, six months of learning. <laughs> I think it's a lot less than that now. But, but anyway, you see it with your own eyes when you have photographic evidence, when, you, when it's being released by intelligence and by military and by government and by people sitting on a beach in Florida who witnessed a spacecraft in a cloud and then you could see it through the cloud, and it left, and it's on video by some lady sitting on a beach, and hundreds of people witnessed it and said the same thing. Then how do you deny it? Especially if you know one of those people that were on that beach, and you believe in them. How do you deny it? See, this is what we're up against right now in the last days, this what if. Where we're at right now, what if these things happen? What if it changes? What if it changes or overnight? Are you prepared? Why has government been moving out of D.C. and moving most of it to Huntsville, Alabama and and outside of Philadelphia and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and you know, say it. Why? You know why? You think they know something you don't know? Yeah. Yeah. You ever seen that movie, The Ark Project? Do you know that's real? 
been created. We watched the movie 2012. That was based on the Mayan calendar. They got the date wrong. See, I'm going to tell you something. For no man will know the time and the place of his coming. It's not up for us to know the time and the place. It's up to us to be prepared for it. That's it. That's our responsibility. Be prepared for it. It's not up for us to know the exact time and place. But with knowledge, you can narrow it down to an approximate time and place. Well, I'd be careful in November. I won't be putting any seminars on the coast in November. I'm just telling you. That's a prediction. I don't know the time and place any more than anyone else does. But I do follow enough information, enough intelligence agencies, enough agencies of government who have been putting this stuff on their website for years. And as I say it on video, they start to take it off real quick. They don't want me panicking the people. But you know what? You know why I tell you this? I don't have to tell you this. I tell you because I love you. Some people are going to say, like some friends of mine in this room, that it's okay. Do I tell the county? If they're mark? still there and they're still in that area at that time, well then, God will either protect them or that's where they were meant to be and they'll perish. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little more of a survivalist than that. So I like to prepare and not perish. That's my uh, that's my thing. But anyway, how are we doing on time? Where's my uh, her? Buzz? Where's your wife? Damn, she you know she runs everything. You're alive for sure. Okay, about 15 more minutes. How about we have a a very quick little uh, I answer questions for you session because there's a lot of new people here who have so many questions that now you're either going to leave and go home and say he's an idiot or you're going to start asking for me to prove it. David? David. That was a long one, too. You know, women, you tell them one quick question, and it's two long ones. Okay, so my questions are... Where well, one at a time, okay? One question at a time. Where can we find the treaty information where we gave Manhattan and the land along the border to the United Nations? You know, I'm going to first start off by telling you, like government is... They don't put everything in one place. If it was that easy, I would really appreciate it. Just put everything in a book. Hence the question. I've been looking and I'm having a little bit of trouble. I know. I know. You're going to find some in the United Nations agreement where we join the United Nations. You're going to find some in the discussions that led up to the United Nations agreement. Number 47. <sighs> Sorry. I'm, I'm just going to tell you. Okay. It is here, there, and everywhere. You have to look at clues. All of this is about, if I took a 10,000-piece puzzle box and I dumped it on the table and I threw the box away without looking at the cover so I didn't know what the puzzle was going to look like, I've had to read so much stuff that I am able to put those pieces together. And then I go, oh, okay, there's what's happening. So I'm trying to tell you, they do not make it easy for us. 
What I appreciate now is I didn't want to find something. I put it on our Telegram channel. And there's 44 to 45,000 beautiful people who love to research, and they tend to find it. And that's what we all should do. Join those Telegram channels and put our questions there and watch our good people, because we got thousands of them, tens of thousands, go to work. Bobby just gets amazed. I love to watch his face. He's like this little kid in a candy store. He gets a question, he puts it on the Telegram channel, says, hey, find this, and boom, 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 25 people found it. It's wonderful. There's things that Bobby and I, that I'd read years ago, and I couldn't remember where I read it. I couldn't remember what agency put it out. And I said, I know it's true. I've read it. Where is it? Bobby goes, watch this. And he's sitting on my back porch at our table, and he types it into our telegram groups, and our telegram researchers found it in about a minute. And I'm going, holy crap. Because I can't keep all that crap in my brain, all right? I just can't. I've got too many things going on and too much to deal with and too many people to deal with. And it's very hard for me to keep storing all that stuff. So once I learn it, I kind of generalize it. I put it into a little book in my brain, and I just start spewing it out of my mouth like a deck of cards. But that question you will be able to find. Rudy Giuliani, when he was mayor of New York, they came to him and he was doing a press conference and they came to him and they said, can you do a, something about all these unpaid traffic tickets by all these people in Manhattan? They owe the city millions and millions of dollars. So the city treasurers and administrators and whoever was running the books came to him and asked him that and he answered it at a press conference. And he says, I can't do anything about that. I'm just the mayor of New York. That's what he said. He has no control over Manhattan Island as a mayor of New York because it's owned by the United Nations, just like the Atlanta Georgia Airport is. People don't know this crap. People don't know there's a building in downtown Salt Lake where if you, as a citizen of Salt Lake in Utah, walked in the building, they'd escort you out under armed United Nations guards. Do you understand this stuff is going on all around us and we don't see it? I got a guy who does graphic arts and he does those uh, things on cars where they put plastic on it, you know, change it, wraps, okay, thank you, wraps, and they, they put graphics on cars. His company got hired to go into these giant warehouses and put UN logos on all these white armored vehicles all across the country. There are those warehouses, multiples, in every state in the United States, and his co company, uh, under a non-disclosure agreement, that's why I'm not saying the name of his company or who he is, got hired to go take these painted vehicles and put the UN stuff on them all across this nation. We are losing this country. This is my country. I was born here and I don't want to lose it. <sighs> Hold on a minute. All right, next question. Second, second question here. is, can you talk more about uh, what you were researching when you went to the Vatican? No. But I will say a few things, okay? I can't tell you what I was there for, what the purpose was, because I'm under an NDA for that, okay? You gotta be afraid sometimes of the people you work for, all right? I'm just gonna tell you that. 
But I did see something that was very amazing to me. It was a Bible the size of this table. And it had 777 books in it. How many does our Bible have? 66. 66. Now, I learned something also while I was there. And this was more than 20 plus years ago. Way more. But I learned something else. I learned that there was another Bible written for King James. A Bible where they didn't take as much out. A Bible with verses that had both what is put in our standard version of the King James from that time and the words that it really said. And so you'll read a verse and it will give you both. And it's, it goes along with one line and then all of a sudden it's bracketed and there's two lines. And then it's bracketed and then it goes on with the verse because it shows you what it used to say and it shows you what it says in the King James Version. Okay. Well, let me finish. Also, it's called the King of Kings Version of the Bible. Don't worry, it took me 20 years to find one and acquire it. 20 years. Because it's only written for kings and queens. And mine's got a little special inscription in the front of who it was written for. Trasa? <laughs> she has been reading it a little bit. I've let her what look at it. Man. And I keep it in my house. And she got to read it a little bit of it. <clears throat> no. And it has the 400 years of history in it between the Old and the New Testament. And that 400 years is pretty precious. Those are little things, advantages that I have because of what I've learned in the past that I've spent a lot of time, work, and effort to acquire. It's a beautiful book and it's all got gold leaf and many, 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 many beautiful illustrations. And it's pretty thick and heavy. It feels like a big chunk of gold. And to me it is. And I could have bought another car for what that Bible cost me to acquire. Okay. So it's very precious to me gives me a lot of knowledge that people don't have because we weren't given everything. And even the kings weren't given everything. And I want you to understand it like this. I believe with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my being that if we would have had all 777 books, we would not be tried tested and forged by fire and not learn the lessons that we need to learn in this world for maybe the next one. We wouldn't learn. I believe God did not allow them to translate it all for us. I believe that. I believe that things were changed in it so that we don't know everything. Because we wouldn't be striving to learn. We just sit there and read one book, 777 books long, and we'd study that for maybe 10 or 12 years, like we went to grade school and high school, and then we'd all be perfect, and our lives would be easy. 
and we would have a utopia on earth if we had all of God's word to tell us what to do and how to do it and how to live the way we should be living to return to him. And I believe that's what would have happened. So I believe we were kept from that so that we would have trouble in our life. And then we would have more temptation and more sin and the ability to get on our knees and repent for that sin and be forgiven. See, I also believe Jesus Christ never would have been crucified had the king of Rome not had a son that was killed in battle and not had a grandson that fell off a horse who was in our rock and died. Because Rome was very righteous up to that point. And then it was turned over to who? The Senate and Congress of Rome who destroyed Rome and it became very evil. Just like we've turned our nation over to Congress and the Senate. And it has become very evil. Exactly right. Gene, grab, grab a mic. Okay, sir, I'd like to ask a question, if, if anybody in this room um, has an answer for it, uh, I haven't understood that answer if there is one, I'd like to find out why. Why in the United States do we have to deal with the Congress and the Senate going on and on and on without term limits. That's what I want to know, because I think the corruption that we have to deal with, a lot of the percentage of it could be eliminated if we had four to six or to eight years of time. Like, I can understand the presidency of being eight years, but I cannot understand the people that run this country supposedly with fairness and justice uh, through the Senate and the Congress if they are righteous-minded people, and most of them, in my opinion, are not, to get rid of the unrighteousness. All we have to do is get term limits and give them a point of uh, opportunity to prove who they are, do right for justice, and do right for the American people and do all the things that we would hope they would do while we put them there. We're the ones that put them in place. It's true, we can vote them out, but, they, but how about the so-called current president who spent 48 years in Congress and never done one damn thing? So explain to me why do we have to deal with a format of um, uh, dealing with a unlimited time for people to go to Washington and tell us what the hell to do when most of them are criminals anyways. And we can see that. Okay. So why can't we get let rid me, of them? Let me answer. Let me answer. All right, I'm going to use a couple of I love for me. I was born there. So I like to pick on California. California has a long-term history of electing really awful women to Congress and the Senate. Okay, anybody agree with me on that? Barbara Boxer, Feinstein, Pelosi, on and on and on. Really awful women who have been there a long time. Okay, we have no, and you're, when you say term limits, 
first of all, they're re-elected every so often, and that's a term limit. However, we don't have a final term limit, which means, okay, you can only be president twice, right? Eight years total, four and four, okay? Those guys can be elected over and over and over again, and I agree with you on that. They should have limits. Well, here's, hold on. You're, you're right, but let me, you're right, but let me, let me tell you um, why it happens. I'm going to just use Nancy Pelosi, Feinstein, and Barbara Boxer as examples. Okay, so you take the state of California. Yeah, that's my version. San Francisco. Sacramento, the Bay Area, San Jose, Sacramento, San Francisco. Three big S's. Okay? You got Los Angeles down here. They, all those bad people come from one of those two areas. They've never had a bad congressman or a bad senator that has been elected from here up. They've never had one that's elected from here to here. They're all elected there and there, the biggest cities, biggest areas. Now, here's the reason. One of them, let's just pick one, the big P. I'd like to turn it into a B, but the big P, her district, San Francisco, she runs, she wins. She wins because of her money, her power, and influence in a very small area. She gets into office. She benefits that area with lots of money, federal funding, federal crap, and does it with such power and influence created in that little square that she runs unopposed every single time. No one can compete with her in that area ever again out of fear of greed, money. That's what it is, that's what it's all about. She gives people so much money, those businesses, those in her area, so many contracts, so much power, so much lobbying dollars come from there to lobby, to create laws, to do. And she uses that area to manipulate the entire country. And that whole Silicon Valley area manipulates the whole country. Gavin Newsom runs that area and runs California, and he's related to Nancy. They're related to the Gettys. There's three families that are basically run all of California for 60 plus years. The last 60 years, I'm going to use 60. I know it's longer. 60 years they've controlled everything in the whole state and how much money goes into that state. One of the wealthiest, most popular states there is. This area grows one-third of all the fruits and vegetables that feed this country. The largest farmland, Central Valley Farmers Association. I put on seminars for the Central Valley Farmers Association. Uh, good, good one, you guys. All right, who, who controlled that? Do you know who was the attorney for the Central Valley Farmers Association back in 2012 when I put on a big seminar for them? And not this kind of a seminar, by the way. It was I have other talents and patents and degrees on hydroponics and farming and how to raise cattle properly. And yeah, I used to do that for universities and put on seminars. Okay. But who runs that? Who ran that then? 
Kamala Harris mm -hmm. was the attorney for the Central Valley of Farmers Association that called me on the phone in 2012 and said, hey, come put on a seminar in Gilroy, California for, for the Central Valley Farmers Association. She flies me at her ex not her, I'm sure she didn't put a dime out of her pocket, at the state of California's expense down there to San Francisco. I jump in a, a car, rental car, the San Francisco airport. I'm driving down the freeway through Silicon Valley headed to where I'm supposed to go. And she says, we have too many people. We've outgrown the venue. Meet us here. And she gave me another venue. Turned out it was a high school gymnasium. I mean, the, the school gymnasium where I went to kindergarten. And I put it on the same seminar for Kamala Harris. There's my personal story with Kamala. And you just got part of it. It got way worse towards the end of the day. <laughs> hey, David. Yeah. Um, you know, since I'd raised my hand earlier and had a question, but I noticed I hit the light while I was going for lunch. Yeah. Um, and just for the record, my dad's 82, and he's not real happy about what's happened to the Hey, I don't blame nation. him one bit. I'm not happy either. If I was happy, I wouldn't be here. We'd, have, we'd be fishing. Yeah. Hey, in my, in my opinion, it's too late for even that. Because it's too late for it. The corruption's already ingrained, and it's been ingrained in our codes, our statutes, our case law, everything. No matter who's in Congress, who's in the Senate, you can never elect another one in, in our history. And it's run, this country is run by the judicial system through case law that's already established. And because of that, this nation's over with until we bring down the Justice Department. second one is that what you said yeah yeah and that's exactly what needs to happen you want to change this nation right now start building gallows and when they're afraid to be corrupt because we will hang them that's when the nation will change we are all right go to lunch now or now. See you back at 2.30. Please let David go have lunch.